Okay, so we finally get a new sermon here. That was kind of a loss for way to go from there. <laughs> but there's so many different directions to go. Um, and I, I want to do just get an idea from you guys. I would like to go in the direction of homology and global. Um, so that's where that's kind of consensus. Then we'll try and cover as much as we can. So there's, there's there's two ways that I can kind of go there as well. One is to focus on the on the you know the details of what's coming, um, and the other way is to give you a slightly more broader overview of um, different topology. So uh, if I go in the way of detail, we won't get very far. You know, we need textures to to go, but I'll, I'll be able to. I'll be able to get to maybe the wrong theorem by the end of it. But where I would like to go with that is um, I'd like to give you a taste of differential topology. Um, it's a beautiful subject and a subject that I think you know it would be great if, if more people in this department would head in that direction. Um, so I, you know my my taste would be to when I say slightly more broad. Uh, it means that I'll skip this, the proof of Stokes' theorem, for example, um, because it's 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 by now intuitive for, for what it should do. It's not a particularly instructive um, proof, but it involves working with a lot of surfaces. Um, and uh, you know, we can we can skip some of that and we can give a slightly more broader um, uh, taste. Of differential topology, and then you know, if you guys would like to go any further in that topic, I can give you recommendations for the end of the, uh, the end of the course. Um, that's the first motivation. The second motivation is um, I would really like to give a more graduate level set of lectures on differential topology, um, kind of in the direction of heading towards MOS theory and those kind of things. Um, <clears throat> so I would like to play the groundwork with that is the option. Um, the, I was going to do that last year, and then the differential geometry class last year didn't get anywhere near what I needed. Um, and so I decided to skip it. So this is a fine opportunity to give to get to with it and then to the neighborhood of the Okay, so any objections to me giving you uh, uh, spending the next eight lectures giving you a taste of differential topology? So this will this will involve so there, there's a couple of different uh, things that that you can take away from this for the mathematician. Um, it's it's you know heading in the direction of um, applying analysis to to uh, algebra essentially. So this is this is um, this is differential topology. Topology is the study of global things on on spaces. Differential in the study of local things on space that this is using the idea of local analysis to to extract information to extract global information about these spaces, right? So the 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 this the whole story manifest in a beautiful theory called Moss theory, and Moss theory is the study of how local structures can give you information about global things about spaces. Right, so there I want to do head in the direction of, um, of um, I know this doesn't sound like it's very mathematical, but it's something it is. Uh, so it's metric quantum mechanics. Um, so the, the, the real kind of illustration of these ideas appeared in symmetric quantum mechanics, and in particular, Edward Whitman's use of symmetric quantum mechanics to prove some long outstanding theorem, which got in the field. Um, so at least some mathematicians think that it's mathematical. Um, so that's that's um, that's the, the, the first thing to get out of uh, this. The second thing to get out of this is, as I threw away as a comment in the last lecture, um, the fact that one really interesting, very exciting um, branch of uh, mathematics right now is computational topology, in particular something called all of the data so of the people that are more interested in, in, in physics. Doesn't really matter what the physics you're interested in. Um, topological data analysis is really discipline blind, so it's, it's good for everything. Um, and it's really about finding 
um, uh, it's about asking questions about the shape of data in data space. Um, and it turns out that this is an extremely powerful thing to do, and it has to do with some sort of front of mathematics called um, persistent homology, which was started by a guy called Simon Carlson, who was a mathematician, he was still is a mathematician at uh, some of the so that's that's roughly the, the two things that you can get out of this, depending on your on, on your own interest. But if there's no objection, it's in the next eight lectures, I will spend talking about synthesis and how synthesis contribute to homology um, and well how they contribute to cohomology, and then when we talk about forms and synthesis, we're going to do today. This is really the story of um uh, sorry, homology. Okay. I will put all of those things together in terms of two theorems for counter radio LD, which tells us how to relate these two things by an integral. So today I want to basically go towards um, the statements, the proper statement of scope theorem. So again, I'm not going to prove scope theorem to you. It's not difficult, but it's just long winded and not particularly instructive. Uh, but we'll lay all the groundwork uh, for this today. And if you want, you are very welcome. You can find any, um, well, most different geometry textbooks. And we'll spend some time uh, proving scope theorem. Um, but I'm going to tell you how we can convert each of the, the, the pieces of Stokes' theorem into a rigorous uh, statement. So it will more or less sketch out. The so I left off last time telling you about syntax and that the syntax is a generalization of uh, polyhedron. Um, and that's uh, what we want to do is take the idea of integration over some general curve space and convert it into integration over um, some of that space. And the way we do this technically is following what you've learned in first year already where you approximated the area under a curve by a bunch of flat polyhedra that you knew how to calculate, uh, whose area you knew how to calculate, therefore whose integral you knew how to calculate. And then you added all of these things up and you refined your, uh, your drawings of polyhedron. There are technical mathematical terms for that. You take a curve space and you break it up into flat pieces, that's called a tessellation or triangulation on that space. Right? Essentially, you cover, up with, you cover it with triangles. Each of those triangles is flat, and that gives you an associated um, space that, has, that is topologically the same, um, but geometrically easier to work with. For example, um, a triangulation of, um, of a sphere, or two sphere, is a soccer ball. A soccer ball is, is not a two sphere, it's a truncated uh, icosahedron. Um, which is made up of pentagons and hexagons that are all flat. But you glue them together, and on the vertex where uh, the edges come together, that's where all of the curvature of that space. So I know we haven't really spent much time um, talking about curvature and, and associated um, invariance in this course because I want to enter the direction of topology rather than the direction, rather than the direction of geometry. But to all of these manifolds, any of these general manifolds, you can ascribe a, an invariance called um, curvature. The Riemann curvature, take the contraction of the Riemann curvature by using the, uh, the interior product, just contracting indices, and you'll get reaching curvature and then scalar curvature. Right? So scalar curvature is what um, relativists tend to, to focus on. And the point is that. Um, a sphere, a two sphere, is a surface of constant curvature. So everywhere on that on that two sphere, the curvature is, is the same, right? When you replace a two sphere with a soccer ball, and you've replaced that curved surface with a bunch of flat surfaces, pentagons and hexagons, those are all flat. But anywhere on the face of that soccer ball, the curvature is zero, right? Faces come together in edges. You can find your favorite soccer ball and look at it. You find that faces are, are sewn together on, on edges. And edges are sewn together on vertices. For a soccer ball, if you calculate the, the, the curvature of that soccer ball, the same square of curvature that is constant on a two-sphere, you'll find that it is 
it has delta function support for that condition say space zero everywhere except where it's not zero. Um, and where it's not zero in this case, uh, where that support is on the vertices. So uh, for a soccer ball, a soccer ball is flat everywhere except on the vertices where all the curve is. Okay, so uh, this is what's called a triangulation or a tessellation of uh, two sphere. There are many different tessellations of the two sphere. Um, for example, a cube is a tessellation of the two sphere um, that is topologically the same, but obviously geometrically different. And the point is that I can do things on flat space um, much easier than on, on a general space. Right? So we have surfaces that are generalizations of polyhedron. Um, and the goal here is to map an integral over the general curve space, which we don't know how to do, into integrals over flat things, the simplicities, which we do know how to do. Okay? Basically, doing an integral, uh, I, I will do one just now. Um, I, I wrote down two simplicities, two static simplicities on the plane and on three space. Uh, on the plane, it's a triangle, and on three space, it's a, it's a pyramid, um, uh, a, a right pyramid. And you can do integral on these on these things. There are well-defined there. There's a kind of integral that you've been learning from the second year. Um, so that's the that's the goal. And then we'll end with the statement of um Sokta theorem, which I've before, but that, that now all these things make sense. And then um, I'll leave it for you to go find some set of evidence for this thing to be true by doing some exercise. Okay. So some of the things that are important is um on uh, on R to the R, and I'll call those coordinates uh, X mean. So let X mean be local coordinates in R to the R. We're going to be working with R forms and um, trying to integrate in R forms. Um, now, so that's why I could want to be R. Um, in terms of which Omega, some R form in Omega to the R, R to the R, can be written. Um, omega equal to some function for the A of the mix mu. I'm going to drop it here that because I want to show sure that it is dependent on, on the X mu. Ex1 due to range EXR. Then, given this, we can define integration of omega um, on the standard simplex um, sigma r in, in r to the r um, the following way. So, the integral of omega in r form over the standard simplex that I the last time, um, sigma r bar defines the, the integral. Of a x dx one dx two all the way through to dx r um, over sigma r bar. The point here is that the thing on the right hand side is just the usual r fold integral. R dimensional. Integral of a function of our variables that means a of x. Okay, so this is you can do. Right, you do it the usual way that you've done it 
Um, but so let me do an example to illustrate. And I'll do an example with the standard two simplex in two dimensional space, the triangle that we wrote down the last time. Suppose I want to do it, I want to integrate. Um, so I'll take R equal to two. Omega equal to um, two point dx equation dy r two and sigma two bar um, as the two simplex. This x y find e naught e one. E2, E1 is the point one zero, E2 is the point zero one, and the origin is the plus zero zero. Okay, and we have a triangle. Um, and I want to do an integral of the two ball omega equal to dx with dy. Over this uh, two symbols. So, by our definition, the integral of um, omega x with dy, a being one there, is just the integral from zero to one of the integral from zero to one minus x. Uh, dy dx, which is the integral from zero to one of one minus x dx. Okay, so again, we've broken up the integral of two form over two complex uh, into a standard iterated integral that you know and love. Evaluate uh, using standard method. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now suppose that I have some R complex in R to the R, and I have a function that's a smooth map from um, that simplex to the mountain. Okay. So suppose. That um, sigma r is an r simplex and the r and f making sigma r to the manifold n is a smooth map. That doesn't necessarily need to have an inverse. In other words, it could map the simplex to a point in, in F. The image of sigma r in M is called a singular simplex in M. Image on the S. So S of sigma r, we're going to call SR, and this FR is called a singular simplex um, in M. And it's called a singular complex because it doesn't necessarily furnish a triangulation of the mountains. Okay. So these are technicalities that, that I'm not going to feature in what's following, but they're important to keep in mind um, when you talk about um, the necessary homology and homologies. Okay. 
Um, so SR is called a singular simplex in M. This just means that set of SRs. Um, Does not furnish in general a triangulation of However, given such a setting. Singular simplexes, I can define a form of thumb of these simplexes okay, by just combining them with some coefficients. Now, in general cohomology theory, we have done with this uh, uh, Stokes theorem, one generally uses um, uh, integer coefficients to add them. In this case, for singular simplexes on a manifold, we will add them. Form of sum with real coefficients. So, given a set yeah, no, singular simplices, are I. We can define a form of sum for the R chain say C D is defined uh, as a sum of I. A I S R I, where these A's are real elements. The set of R chains form a group called the chain group. Denoted by capital C of R. And under this map, S that goes from um, step simplex to uh, from, from simplex to non simplex to manifold, um, I can define the boundary of the simplex. So I can define the boundary of this set of singular simplices on, on, on M by mapping the boundary of the simplex uh, sigma R onto some set of points uh, in M. So boundary again, the boundary of the simplex um, sigma in R to the R. Um, is is easy enough to define that with a set of points around the R. These things become more complicated when you go to the manifold itself, but we're defining the boundary of the singular simplex by mapping the simplex sigma um, to the manifold. So the boundary um, of sigma R, if we would normally denote by D sigma R. Is matched with S to some subset 
The SR, which I defined to be F of the sigma R, the image of the boundary of the simplex sigma R, and the F is a set of R minus one singular simplexes. So here's the story. I start off with some simplex in part of the others. These are triangles or tetrahedra, uh, pyramids, right? And I map these guys onto some surface M. Yeah. Okay, if you want, I shouldn't say surface because it's surface because it's too dark. Some hyper surface there. Um, <clears throat> the sigmas have a boundary, like for example, the boundary of this complex here is the triangle. Okay, um, that triangle, that boundary of the simplex gets mapped to the set of R minus one singular surface in, in the camera. Okay, these singular simplexes in M. Are actually the geometrical boundary of S in M. I'm not going to show that, and we know um, with some effort, but um, the point is that the DSR corresponds to the geometrical boundary of. The SR and, and if you have to do integration with these guys, then I need to tell you about one more feature with the orientation. Right? These guys have a have an orientation that's trivial and inherent from part of the other. Yeah. When I take the boundary of this thing here, yeah, there's an implied orientation um, that comes with it, which is what you go in here with. And as long as I pick one of them, you go in the other direction as well. But as long as I pick one of them, then I have an orientation. Okay. So the boundary of the simplex sigma r has an orientation, as does sigma r, which inherits from the orientation of the of part of the other. Under the map F, if F is, um, if F is uh, defined as, as, as we did there, the SR inherit that orientation. So there's some induced orientation on the SRs um, from the sigma Rs, which they retain. So we can do integration on the uh, singular synthesis SR and their boundaries DSR because of the orientation that they inherit from the sigmas. Okay. Um, so now we can think of the boundary operator, define a boundary operator as a map of a set of um, R chains, the set of R minus one chains. Okay, so the boundary operator takes an R chain, right, and it provides uh, and it gives that an R minus one chain. So acting on, for example, a simple seat here. It takes in this Q simplex, and the output is the boundary of the Q simplex, the oriented boundary. Of the so this is called a boundary operator. The boundary operator um, is a map um, P that takes R chains to R minus one chains. So this is a set of um, R chains. This is a set of R minus one chains. Okay. 
the boundary operator has the property that it is also a notebook operator. And this is easier to show with um, standard mass arguments if not enough, which we will show in some detail um, uh, the next couple of lectures. When we work with such, um, such, such see. But for now, let me just state it. Um, D is a no fault operator. As the square is to zero. Okay. And as I said, anytime you see a no public operator, you should go looking for homology or cohomology structure, well, homology structure in this case, but um, that homology is called cohomology. Um, and that's what we want to talk about now. So for that, I need to define a couple of things, but these things are already we've already talked about in the context of. Forms they now just apply to the same plot of the operator instead of the exterior of the operator. Okay, so if I have some more form, so let CR um, be some R10. If ECR is zero, then CR is. Called um, an R cycles. So, for example, if I take there are an infinite number of so a one chain on a torus is a is a line and okay. a one cycle is the token that can like this. Okay, that's a one cycle on torus. There are an infinite number of one cycle in torus. So this one, for example, I can draw that one, for example. But I can also draw another type of one cycle that looks like that. And similarly, there are an infinite number of these guys. But there are two independent one cycles on the torus. This one and everything that's like it, and this one and everything that's like it. And in fact, the number of one cycle and number of any kind of white cycles from manifold actually determines the genus of the manifold. Okay. Um, so let me ask you a question. Suppose I have a copy line. I know you know that you think that you know what's going on this one. And you add a handle to this copy line. That would tell you that the genus of the stock cup is what's the genus of the stock cup? One. So now imagine you add another handle on the inside. Now this is the value, it's a bad drawing. You see my point there. You put a handle on the inside of the stock cup. Okay. What's the genius of this thing? Okay. Can you see what I've done? Yeah. Put a handle through the copy cup like this. It actually goes all the way. Okay. What is the genius of this? You don't have to answer now, just think about it. Okay. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry, but about the same group. Yeah. Um, because we have like coefficients. Yeah. Or is it not a vector space? It is a vector space. It's called the chain. It's called the chain. It's actually an infinite dimension vector space. Yeah. Um, uh, 
Okay, so that, that's in our cycle. Um, if we can find some CR plus one and CR plus one with CR equal to the boundary of CR plus one, then CR is called an R bound. So cycles form a, uh, the, the cycle group, um, and we're going to call the cycle group ZR. It is also an infinite dimensional vector space. Um, anyone cycle? Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So cycle in the uh, on the manifold form the cycle group, which I'm gonna call that are and set of boundaries form the boundary group. You know. And since um, the boundary operator is not called the operator, this automatically tells me that all boundaries are cyclic automatically. Okay? If I can write uh, an, R, uh, an R chain like this, and if I just apply D to this R chain, and D of the R is automatically zero because D is finished. So the statement is that a set of boundaries. Is a subset of the set of cycles. So all boundaries are cycles. The really non trivial question is when is a cycle necessarily a bound? Okay. Well, to determine when cycle of the boundary we need to do, we need to talk about something called the homology so the r singular homology Defined to be the defined to be of cycles modular bounds. It's going to put this up there for the moment. We're going to come back to it. Um, The moment though, I just want to define that it's likely um, the integral of an R form over an R chain. So, given all of this, we can define the 
So I know how to do this integral. It's just like doing an integral like that. And once I have this, that tell me what this what these guys are. So now this formal sum that I use to start the chain. Okay. So formally, this is how to do integration on a map. As I said, um, we have all the necessary ingredients to um, prove this theorem, but it's a bit long and it's a bit um, uh, tedious and not particularly um, instructive. Sorry. The theorem that I'm about to write now. So all of this together gives us the ingredients to take scopes of theorem. Which is that given some R form omega on a manifold, the integral of its exterior derivative over the manifold, sorry, define these two chains over the R chain, R plus one chain. So this is equal to the integral of omega over the boundary of that R. So C here is an element of C R and omega is an element of a set of R forms on M and D C is the boundary of uh, C. So the dope theorem. Um, and as I said, we have the tools in order to prove the scope here, but because it's not particularly instructive, um, I'm going to point you to um, literature if you're without the proof if you want it. And instead, I'm going to give you um, some exercises to show 
that's what we do. And it's still there. But for the most part, it should not be a surprise, right? Like, yeah, that so here the generalized so here and just like any old um common theorem calculus that you've been familiar with today. Um and it takes it and again it takes the integral of the derivative of something called some region and it passes to or is equal to the integral of that something on the boundary of that region. Right? Perhaps the definition of integration K is why do we need what we can do to extend the integral of um but the C of the name of all that. Uh, the logic that necessarily does the chain that like the start of all that. It does. So, for example, the two chain on the chorus, the whole chorus itself. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, they're compatible um, uh, statements. This one happens to come from a homology point of view. This is the one that we use to define, for example, uh, uh, URB between chains and forms. Okay. All right, so as an exercise, then I want you to convince yourself that this is true. Um, and I'll put this in the in the next exercise as well. Um, but let's bring this one in now. So take uh, M to be R3 and Omega. Be the one form of the x must be y plus b z and show that and psi to be the two form um, a half psi mu nu dx nu dx nu so one that Stokes theorem becomes uh so that's One is the statement that one the integral over S um, of the curl of omega plus the S is the integral, both the integral over the boundary of S. Um, of omega plus the L, where omega again is a vector of these coefficients a, b, and c. Omega vector of a should be and ds is a little area element on s, and the L is a line element on the curve that bounds us. Second thing is to show that um, an S is some, uh, some two dimensional surface in RB. Second thing I would like to show is that when I integrate um, the divergence. Of psi over some volume B, then this is just um, the closed integral over the two surfaces bounding B, or DB of psi dotted with um, yes, but DS is a normal vector to a surface uh, DB and psi again. We have a vector components side one, side two, side three, and side lambda is epsilon lambda mu nu uh, side. So this is of course. 
Data stuff is here. This is what's known as the evidence of gospel. So let me stop there for today. And then I think that's a Friday, right? So then we will talk on Friday, we will mostly talk about various types of models. Um, uh, as the start to an independent dependent model. Right.